So hello everyone and welcome to the first seminar for the 2022-2023 academic year. Uh, today we have a pleasure of having one of our own, Daniela Witten, give a talk. So this quarter, uh, by the way, we will have a little bit of a theme of UW speakers, so hope you all join us for the rest of the seminars as well. So a little bit of an intro about Daniela. So as you all know, Daniela is a professor of statistics and biostatistics at the University of Washington. She's also the Dorothy Guilford Endowed Chair in Mathematical Statistics. And uh, her research involves the development of statistical machine learning method with, for high dimensional data with applications to genomics, neuroscience, and other fields. Uh, Daniela is also the recipient of a number of honors and awards, most recently the 2022 COPS President Award, a very pre prestigious award, for her contributions towards statistical machine learning with applications to biology and for communicating fundamental ideas in the field to a broad audience. Uh, the, so I, I have to have a list because there's a lot of awards. Uh, Daniela has also received an NIH Director's Early Independence Award, a Sloan Research Fellowship, an NSF Career Award, a Simons Investigator Award, Mathematical Modeling of Living Systems, a David Beyer Award, a Gertrude Cox Scholarship, and an NDSEG Research Fellowship. <laughs> this is all from the website. Uh, her work has also been feature featured in popular media, among others, uh, Forbes Magazine, Elle Magazine, and KUOW. Uh, and furthermore, Daniela is a co-author of a very popular te textbook you've all probably used, An Introduction to Statistical uh, Learning, or Statistical Machine Learning. Um, okay, so I will stop there with all the honors, and uh, I will let Daniela take over. So her talk is Double Dipping Problems and Solutions with Applications to Single Cell RNA Sequencing Data. Uh, thank you so much, Emma, for the intro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, Amy, for that. So today I'm going to talk about um, a, a, a very long title that you just heard about from Emma. But first, I just want to mention um, that I haven't given the department seminar here since 2010, which is a really long time. So I'm planning to actually just give a talk where I have like one slide per paper that I've written in the last 12 years, just so that you don't miss anything. Just kidding. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> All right. That would be terrible. Don't don't ever give a talk like that, please. Um, great. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, what I call double dipping and some of the work that my students have done in recent years on um, in this area of work, which is still a very active research area for me. So the idea behind this talk is that we all know how statistics is taught because either we teach the courses or we're in the courses. And what we learn is that if you're going to test a hypothesis, you need to go into it knowing exactly what hypothesis you're going to test before you ever look at the data, maybe even before you collect the data, actually. And this is what we, um, we tell our students to do. It's how we write our textbooks. It's what we tell our collaborators to do. But that is totally unrealistic. That is not actually what happens. Um, we visualize our data. We cluster it. We perform dimension reduction and more in practice, in real life, in the world we live in. And only then do we decide what hypothesis to test. So there's this really big disconnect between the theory and the practice here. And for the most part, as statisticians, we sort of look the other way because we know that our collaborators are, are doing this. And furthermore, we don't even have like a viable alternative to, to, prevent them, to present them with as an option, right? Because like, this is what they have to do because they've collected data. They don't know in advance what hypotheses they wanna test. And so they've got to explore their data first. So my talk today is about bridging the gap um, and making it so that a procedure like this, where you perform data exploration and then test hypotheses based on your data, might not be problematic. So I'm going to start by talking about why this, this idea of exploring your data and then testing a hypothesis based on that exploration, why that's a problem. And then I'll talk about some solutions in some specific settings. Um, so in this, in this talk, I'm going to use the phrase double dipping. And just to be completely clear about what I mean by that, double dipping is kind of what it sounds like where I'm gonna use the data twice. I'm first gonna dip into the data to do some exploration and maybe to generate a hypothesis. And then I'm gonna dip back into the data to test the hypothesis. And so to be clear, double dipping is something that scientists often do in practice, perhaps because they don't have better alternatives. And today I'm gonna to be presenting sort of a statistical alternative to this problematic double dipping approach. Um, and hopefully it will um, 
motivate you to think about sort of like what type of data exploration maybe in the application areas that you're interested in are happening and how we can help researchers do more rigorous statistics after that data exploration in whatever fields you're interested in. Okay, so today, just as an application area, I'm going to be talking about single cell RNA sequencing data, which is like a pretty um, important type of data in biology in the last few years that uses a pretty new technology that allows us to measure the expression of, of tens of thousands of genes and hundreds of thousands of cells. And so like back when I was in grad school or even, you know, as many as as few as five years ago, this wasn't the type of data that people collected. Instead, people would um, collect gene expression data where basically they would like take a piece of tissue, like if they're interested in studying the liver, they would take a piece of liver tissue, like stick it in a blender, and then compute sort of the average gene expression across all the cells in that liver tissue. But now we have this newer technology called single cell RNA sequencing that operates at a much higher level of resolution where if you get that liver tissue, you don't need to stick it through the blender. You actually can take measurements from each individual cell. So this is like this pretty amazing technology developed in the last few years that makes it possible to get this incredibly high resolution picture of the activity or the expression of genes um, across cells. And this is very high dimensional data, lots of rows, lots of columns. Okay, so what do people do with this data? Well, sort of like big picture, there's sort of a two-step pipeline that the biologists typically take when they're analyzing this data. <clears throat> so step one, they're, they typically try to identify some type of latent structure in the data. So as I mentioned, this is very, very big data with you know hundreds of thousands of cells on the rows, tens of thousands of genes on the columns. And so in order to even like begin to make sense of this data, we somehow need to reduce its dimensionality. And there's a number of ways that that's done. So one approach is through clustering. So one thing that investigators often do is they cluster the cells, which are like the rows of this data. And what I'm showing here on the left is just an image from a paper where what they've done is they've clustered the cells so each dot here represents a cell. They've clustered the cells. They got around 39 clusters in this figure. Each is shown in a different color and numbered. And then they're, they're displaying these clusters just like in a two-dimensional space. So you can think about this as like the first two principal components of the data. Um, of course, the original data has like tens of thousands of genes. So the original data is tens of thousands of dimensions. Um, so that's sort of one type of latent structure they might be interested in. And another type of latent structure is what's shown on the right. It's known as trajectory inference. And maybe the exact details here don't matter so much, except to say that like what they call trajectory inference amounts to like projecting the, the cells onto some low dimensional space. And you could achieve that using principal components analysis if you wanted to, although PCA isn't typically the dimension reduction that they do. But the point is big picture for step one, just imagine you know some technique to identify a low dimensional structure underlying the data, such as clustering or principal components analysis. Okay, so that's step one. But once investigators are done that, what they want to do is perform what they call a differential expression analysis, which is like biology language for testing whether each gene, and remember they have like 20,000 genes, is associated with this latent structure. So this amounts to performing 20,000 hypothesis tests, where each hypothesis test involves the output of the previous or rather each hypothesis in step two involves the output of step one. Yeah. No, please. Room for error. Um, so I think like, for example, imagine that you're studying like stem cells that are like developing over time and there's a heterogeneity among the cells because there's like stem cells at different stages of differentiation, for example. Um, or maybe you're studying like um, a tumor sample and some of the cells are like cancer cells and others are like normal non-cancer cells. So there's, there's gonna be heterogeneity. These are not like IID cells. Um, okay, great. So, so just sort of to, illustrate that this isn't like a, a pipeline, this two-step procedure that I just described, this isn't something that happened once or twice that I'm making the focus of my research agenda. This is like a thing that people do. So here's an example. This is a paper published in Nature in 2019. Um, and you can see this little schematic that is taken from their paper where they first got some liver tissue. They did single cell RNA sequencing on it. Then they're displaying a heat map of just like the gene expression data where the rows are the cells and the features are the columns. And then they, they did clustering. And that's actually the same clustering schematic that I showed you earlier. And then associated with this nature paper, 
is a tidy. Um, no, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Shiny, thank you. Like two two syllables. It's been a long day. Is a as a tidy shiny. Thank you. Oh my god. All right. So so basically the way that this works. I'm sorry. This is a little bit small, but you can specify which um, cluster you want. Like cluster eleven and cluster fourteen. Eleven and fourteen. And then what this website allows you to do is output a p-value for each gene. So what are these p-values for? Well, this is a p-value, for example, the jth one is a p-value, testing the null hypothesis that the expression for the jth gene is equal in clusters 11 and 14, where the reason we're interested in clusters 11 and 14 is because that's what I input here. Okay, so the, the point is, like this is not only something that people are doing in nature papers, it's something that people are doing in nature papers and like um, releasing shiny, did I get that right? Shiny apps for. Great. Um, so we can think a little bit about those p-values. Um, are those p-values valid? And this is the actual uh, function that they use to compute those p-values. This is from like a very popular piece of software called Surat, which you can see had like 4,000 citations actually when I took the screenshot, which to be honest was a couple years ago. So probably has a lot more than 4,000 citations now. This is like the premier software for analyzing single cell RNA sequencing data. And if you read the details page, they say p-values should be interpreted cautious, cautiously as the genes used for clustering are the same genes tested for differential expression analysis. So in other words, they've double dipped their data. They've used their data twice. So, and they seem to understand that there's an issue because they said there is an issue. But again, just because we know there's a problem doesn't mean that we know how to solve it. And again, this is exactly what I'm referring to as double dipping. Okay, but you know, I showed you a nature paper, but maybe I just cherry pick that paper. So again, are we sure this is a problem that we need to spend a lot of energy trying to solve? And the answer is yes, because this is very pervasive. So this is a review article published in Genome Biology in 2020, um, grandiosely entitled 11 Grand Challenges in Single Cell Data Science. So not even just single cell RNA sequencing, because there's different types of single cell data. This is all of single cell data science. And if you read challenge number two, if you read the words of it, they're saying that the problem is that the vast majority of differential expression detection methods assume that the groups of cells to be compared are known in advance. However, current analysis pipelines typically rely on clustering to identify such groups without propagating the uncertainty in these assignments or accounting for the double use of data. So again, this is not like a problem that we are pointing out. This is a problem that's very, very well understood but people can write a review article saying that this is a problem without posing a solution. And so we're gonna to try to bridge that gap and pose a statistical solution to this problem. Okay, so now in a bit more detail, what's the actual problem here? I keep on saying that there's a problem, but let's sort of like think about this a little more statistically. And you may already have sort of intuition for what the problem is, but if not, here's a chance to build it. So first we're gonna sample 100 cells IID from let's say like a normal zero one distribution or something in two dimensions, because I only know how to make pictures in two dimensions. So that's what we have here. There's no clusters here. This is just like plain vanilla null hypothesis, nothing interesting. Now we're gonna cluster the cells and I can, anytime you give me data, I can cluster it. It doesn't mean that the clusters are gonna be meaningful, but I can, sure, I can cluster it, no problem. So look, I clustered the cells. And now I'm gonna ask a question, which is, is there a difference between the mean of the green cells and the orange cells? So if I ask this question and then I compute a p-value corresponding to the answer to this question, I get very small p-values like 10 to the negative six. There are three p-values because there's three pairs of clusters, three choose two equals three, hopefully. Um, okay, so now I'm like a really big fan of sort of not making things harder than they need to be. So before we keep going, we should see, is there a simple solution to this problem? Because if there's a simple solution, we don't need to make this a whole like research agenda. We can just do the simple thing. So as someone who comes from kind of like a statistical machine learning background, the simple solution to this type of problem often has to do with just splitting your data into a training set and a test set, right? So let's see if we can do that. We're gonna try to solve this problem by just splitting our observations, which in this case are cells, into a training set and a test set. So on the left, I've just simulated data once again from a normal zero one distribution, there's no clusters, this is null data, nothing interesting happening. And now I've split into a training and a test set at random. I'm clustering the training set to get two clusters shown in orange and green 
And then I'm applying those clusters to the test set. Now, the exact details of how I apply those clusters to the test set isn't terribly important. Here I use three nearest neighbors classification. It actually turns out it doesn't really matter what you do. But to be clear about what I did here, like each L, each observation or each cell in the test set, I just found it's three nearest neighbors in the training set. And if those neighbors were mostly orange, I colored it orange. And if they're mostly green, I colored it green. OK, and now I'm just going to test the null hypothesis that there's no difference in the population means between the orange and the green clusters on the test set. And uh-oh, I got a small p-value again. My p-value is like 10 to the negative 5. So this is really bizarre at first because you're like, well, I used a training set and a test set. I clustered on the training set, and then I tested for a difference between those clusters on the test set what went wrong. And the answer to what went wrong has to do with step three. So I needed some way to label the test set observations using those clusters that I got on the training set. But any way that I can think of to transfer those labels from the training set to the test set, any way that I can think of to do that is going to somehow have to involve like the like the physical position of these test set observations, like the fact that this one's located here versus being located there. So Step three is performing double dipping. I've actually double dipped my test data in the act of doing step three. And this doesn't have to do with the choice of three nearest neighbors classification. Really, anything that you do to color those orange and green observations, unless you're coloring them like irrespective of their position in XY space, which wouldn't make sense because then they wouldn't correspond to clusters, um, is going to double dip. So the point is, no, to answer the question on the top of the slide, no, we cannot solve this problem via cell splitting. So we need to do something that's going to be more sophisticated than that. Because cell splitting also has an inflated type 1 error rate. Again, we would like to see p-values that follow a uniform distribution because the null hypothesis holds here. And obviously, this, this doesn't follow a null distribution. OK, so the outline for my talk today, I'm going to talk about sort of two different sets of ideas. So the first set of ideas that I'm going to talk about, I'm referring to as selective infer inference for clustering. And we can think about this as a really bespoke or tailored approach that's really customized to the data analysis procedure. So as we're going to see, this sort of this part one sort of starts off like a general framework, but then to actually instantiate that framework, we're going to need to understand the details of exactly how we're doing clustering. And those, those details can become like a little bit beastly. And then in part two, I'm going to talk about count splitting for single cell RNA sequencing data, um, which is more recent work. And this is, well, actually, both parts of this work are pretty recent. Um, and the second part is a one size fits all approach. And it's one size fits all in the sense that once you have committed yourself to a distributional assumption on your data, then it doesn't actually matter to me what type of data exploration you're doing and also how you're going to conduct hypothesis testing after that data exploration, because I'm just going to treat it like a black box. I don't even care. So with no further ado, I'm going to start talking about selective inference for clustering. And just to reiterate again what the problem is, so I have some data generated under the null hypothesis where there's no clusters. I perform some clustering. And then I just want to ask, are the cluster means really different? And of course, in order for that question to make sense statistically, we need to formalize things a bit. So what we're going to do is we're just going to consider like a really simple model where we have an n by q data set x where we have n rows and q features, n observations and q features. And the ith row, or the ith observation, is drawn from a multivariate normal distribution with some mean vector mu i of length q, and then some known covariance. And I've written here that the covariance is a multiple of the identity. Um, it doesn't need to be. It's just that like things work out nicely on slides if your covariance matrix is a multiple of the identity, but that's not an important assumption. It does need to be known, though. I'm assuming that the covariance is known. OK, so now we're going to cluster the rows of x to get clusters, which I'm going to call c1 hat through ck hat. So for example, c1 hat, that's the set of indices of the observations that I've assigned to the first cluster. And I have little hats on the c's. And the reason for that is because these clusters are a function of the data. These aren't like population quantities. These are like sample estimates of the clusters. And then I'm going to define mu bar ck hat to be the population mean associated with the kth cluster. So I need to be completely upfront. Mu bar C hat K is like a pretty messed up quantity. And the reason that it's messed up, I can see Fong looks so stressed in the second row because he's seeing how messed up this quantity is. The reason that it's messed up is because we have mu i's in there, which are population quantities. Those are population means. 
And then we have CK hats, which are a function of the data. So this is sort of a weird thing where it kind of looks like maybe a population parameter because it has a Greek letter, but it's not because it involves the data through those CK hats. Okay. But the question we're going to ask is, can we test the null hypothesis that mu bar CK hat equals mu bar C hat K prime for some K not equal to K prime? So for some pair of clusters, where again, the clusters are estimated from our data. And again, like just to reiterate, this null hypothesis is weird and in a way like fundamentally problem. Good. Fang's nodding. Yeah, it's it's weird and it's kind of like fundamentally problematic in the sense that like our null hypotheses should involve parameters, they should involve data. And we need to think about like, what does this actually mean and what are we trying to accomplish here? Okay. But for the moment, we're just gonna suspend disbelief and we're just gonna like barrel on through without thinking very hard. And so we don't think very hard about the fact that this is a weird null hypothesis. Then to test this null hypothesis, we might wanna just do like a standard wall, te wall type test. So here, what I'm saying is that I'm going to define a p-value to be the probability under the null hypothesis of seeing as big of a difference between the means of the kth and k prime clusters as I saw. So like capital X is the random variable, little x is the observation. And here, I'm just like using a ruler to see how far apart is the cluster mean for the kth and k prime clusters. And yes. Yes, C hat K is re referring to an average over the observations that were in the kth cluster that I estimated from the data. But the left hand side is uh, capital X. That's, that's like any random variable. Okay. Simulated. Sorry. Generated. Yeah. Simulated. Okay. Right. right. Yeah. Sorry. I may, I may have said it wrong. But what I'm trying to say is that so CK hat, I clustered. What it's saying on the left, I'll tell you just in words what we're saying on the left. On the left, we're saying we just have like a random draw from the data, we cluster, and then we take the difference in means. And on the right. So there's different C hat. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> Sorry, it's the same C. No, it's the same CK hat. It's the same CK hat. Oh. Yeah, it's the same CK hat. And that's this is why this is why there's a problem is because I got CK hat. My CK hat might be like one, two, three, and the other CK hat prime is like four, 17, 19. And so like on the right hand side, CK hat came from the data little x, but on the left hand side, CK hat still came from the data little x. Yeah. That's that's why there, that's why there's gonna be a problem. I mean, you're anticipating the like it says naive on the um, I should have written on the subject song. Wait a moment. Okay, but this is this is going to be a problem. Okay, so but but again, we're suspending disbelief. We're just pretending we didn't notice that CK hat is this weird thing, and we're going to say, well, remember, I assumed that XI was independently drawn from a normal distribution. So then, this is just the probability that a chi squared random variable with q degrees of freedom exceeds some threshold. Okay, but the problem is under the null hypothesis, we'd like this p value to follow a uniform zero one distribution if this really is a p value. And it's not going to follow a uniform zero one distribution. Yeah. Well, the problem. I don't know how to do samples. I don't know how to do sample splitting here because CK hat refers to like a set of indices. That... Um, I did not quite catch the question in there, but I'd love to talk about that offline with you. I was just wondering if I logged Okay. So just again, to reiterate in words, like what is going wrong here when I say it's not uniformly distributed under the null hypothesis, what I mean is that, um, the, we know that the right-hand side is going to be big. The reason that we know that the right-hand side is going to be big is 
is because the whole way that I got CIK and CIK prime was by clustering the observed data little x. But on the left-hand side, that CK hat and CIK prime were just something that I was handed. And so the left-hand side is not going to be as big as the right-hand side. And that's the intuition here. So I think there's a lot of different ways we could go about trying to fix this, which may be what you suggested. Um, and I'd love to hear offline if you have some way that might be ac actionable. No. OK. Um, OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to correct this test. And the way we're going to do that is by conditioning on the hypothesis selection procedure. And to do that, we're going to define a p-value, which looks like the previous one. So once again, it's the probability under the null hypothesis of observing such a big difference between the estimated clusters. But now we're going to condition on the fact that clustering the data gave us CIK and CIK prime. Where, again, to clarify the answer to Fung's earlier question, CIK and CIK prime are the clusters that we got on our actual observed data little x. So what's the reason here? Well, we need to think back about the logic that got us to be interested in this null hypothesis. The reason we're interested in this null hypothesis in the first place is because clustering the data gave us CIK and CIK prime. If clustering the data hadn't given us CIK and CIK prime, it wouldn't in 10,000 years. So in order to even justify the decision to test this null hypothesis, we got to be in a universe where we got these clusters. In other words, we are going to test this hypothesis conditional on the fact that we decided to test this hypothesis, that we selected this hypothesis. And, and the way to do that is by clustering or rather conditioning on the fact that clustering the data gave us CIK and CIK prime. Again, because if clustering the data hadn't given us CIK and CIK prime, we would not have ever tested this hypothesis. I mean, what's the definition? The def is the definition of something that under in the null hypothesis has a uniform zero one distribution. And that's what is happening here. So this has a property that it controls the selective type one error rate. So in other words, it has it follows under the null hypothesis, it follows a uniform distribution provided, or rather in the subset of the universe that involves deciding to test this null hypothesis. So conditional on deciding to test this null hypothesis, this p-value follows a uniform zero one distribution. It is a p-value. Just usually we aren't conditioning on things when we talk about p-values, but here we're conditioning on the event that we decided to test this null hypothesis. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they can ask. Hi, this is Mary. Um, so um, I have a question here. It seems like you're actually testing the positions that are in the two clusters rather than the um, protein identities. So in your test set, it seems to me the protein identities should be just all mixed up and everywhere. So if the orange cluster consists of TP53 and um, I don't know, Apobac and the green cluster has um, insulin in it and some other things that the the test set and the test set all those um, proteins could be in could be anywhere and so if you say what's the centroid of those proteins that were in cluster one number one and the centroid for those that were in cluster number two wouldn't the test size be correct so I think maybe you know, like I mean, a simpler analogy might be helpful here. So I have some new grad students this year, and suppose I notice that they're all very tall. And then I'm like, wow, these grad students are tall. I'm going to test the null hypothesis that these grad students are all, you know, taller than average. Okay. Well, I the reason I decided to test this null hypothesis is because they're all tall. And in particular, the reason I decided to test this null hypothesis is because I noticed that they were all above like five foot eight or whatever. So when I test that null hypothesis, I better condition on the fact that the only reason I'm testing this null hypothesis is because they're all at least five foot eight. Like for example, if it turns out that they're all five foot eight and like, you know, one millimeter, then I guess I should not be impressed be, by the evidence um, brought on by my hypothesis test. Because the whole reason I decided to test that hypothesis is I noticed they were tall in the first place. You know what I mean? 
On the other hand, if my criteria for deciding that people are tall is five foot eight, and then my grad students are all seven feet tall, now there's going to be a lot of evidence to reject the null hypothesis that they're just normal height. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully that makes sense as an analogy. And that's really the selective inference framework, which PS, like this framework, um, actually I have some citations here. This framework has been used in a lot of settings in the statistics literature, but mostly in the context of regression and less so in the context of exploratory data analysis. Okay, so we have this p-value, we want to compute it. Um, but it turns out it's very hard to compute in the sense that I can write it down, but I don't know how to actually like literally calculate it. So what I'm going to do is a little trick that comes out of the selective inference literature where I'm going to condition on a bit more. So this, this more information that I'm going to condition on, I'm just going to do this for computational convenience, but it's going to be handy because conditioning on more is going to maintain selective type one error control. In other words, when I condition on additional information, I'm still going to get this nice property where given that I decided to test this null hypothesis, my p-values are going to be uniformly distributed under the null. Um, okay, so what else should I condition on and why? And the answer is I'm going to condition on a whole bunch of linear algebra. And this looks terrible, but the good news is you don't need to read it because, well, first I'll just tell you one thing, which is a new hat is a vector of length n that, so that x transpose new hat is the cluster means. But it turns out that this linear algebra is going to have a really simple visual explanation on the next slide. So if you can just kind of not stress about this right now and just wait a minute, first I'm going to just show you why this conditioning is useful. And the reason that it's useful is because this allows me to rewrite my p-value as the probability under the null hypothesis that some random variable phi exceeds some threshold, given that clustering x prime of phi gave me the two clusters that I'm interested in. And so now what is x prime of phi? Well, x prime of phi is a matrix. It has the same dimension as the original data matrix x. And actually, x prime of phi is very similar to x in the sense that if there's an observation that isn't in the two clusters of interest, then th that row of x and that row of x prime of phi are identical. But if there's an observation that is in the clusters of interest, then x prime of phi is going to perturb that observation. And specifically, it's going to perturb that observation in a very specific way. And so this is the reason for the linear algebra is so that the perturbation looks very specific. So let's talk about what this perturbation looks like. Well, here's my original data. So let's say that I have two clusters, C hat K, C hat K prime, that are my clusters of interest. And then I also have some other observations that you know can be in their own cluster. I don't really care about them. So X prime of phi is shown on the right. And X prime of phi looks just like X, but we've pulled apart the observations in the K and K prime clusters. But nothing else has changed. We've just pulled them apart in the in the dimension, in the direction of that difference between cluster means. And if phi is small, then once again, x prime of phi is just like x, but we've pushed together those two clusters. And if phi equals the, the actual observed difference between the clusters, then x prime of phi is just x. So basically, if we, if we go back here, what we can see is that this terrible linear algebra, it was just set up in such a way so that instead of having to think about all of the possible x's in the known universe, which would involve a lot of nuisance parameters and be computationally intractable, at least for me, we are just restricting ourselves to the set of x's that look like the original data, but that push and pull just the two clusters of interest. I'm conditioning on more. Exactly. So I'm going to maintain selective type 1 error control, but I'm going to lose potentially a bit of power. Great. Um, OK. So, so now my job is actually easy, because I've said that this p-value that I care about is just the probability under the null hypothesis that some random variable, which by the way happens to follow a chi distribution with q degrees of freedom, exceeds some threshold, conditional on the fact that clustering this data x prime of phi gives me the clusters of interest cfk and cfk prime. And so we all know from like stat 513 or whatever, or I don't know, well some class, we all know that this is just like one minus the CDF of a chi squared distribution or a chi distribution with q degrees of freedom, truncated to a set s. And that's the real sticky part is I need to truncate the CDF to the set of phi, such that cluster x prime of phi gives me CIK and CIK prime. And so it turns out that what I've done with all this conditioning and linear algebra and stuff is I've just like actually moved, it's sort of like kicked the can down the road, where now what I need to do is compute a set S. I need to find the set of phi such that perturbing the data x by an amount phi gives me the two clusters I'm interested in. And then, I'll, and then, then I'm going to be done, but I have to compute the set S. And it turns out that computing the set S is really sticky. Um, and it's going to very much depend on the problem at hand and the type of clustering that I'm doing. 
everything that I've talked about so far, it's like for any type of clustering, it didn't matter. The only assumption we made was multivariate normality of the data, but we didn't care what type of clustering it was. And starting at this moment to compute the set S, we need to be specific about what type of clustering we're doing. And so today I'm gonna to just very briefly talk about two types of clustering, hierarchical clustering and k-means clustering. And I'll talk about how we can compute the set S for each of these types of clustering so that we can obtain valid p-values for a difference in cluster means after clustering. All right, so first I'll talk about hierarchical clustering. And this work was led by my former PhD student, Lucy Gao, who is now faculty at University of British Columbia in the statistics department. So basically there's like one key result that like underlies the magic behind how we're able to characterize the set S. And the magic is that if we think about this perturbation of the data X prime of phi, remember our goal is to find the set of phi so that perturbing X prime of phi gives me the same clusters as perturbing X, right? That's what we wanna do. And there's this like key fact, which sort of looks a little bit surprising, but actually you can show without too much trouble, which is that if you cluster X prime of phi and you cluster X, the only way that they can give you the same clusters is if everything below the spot where those clusters appear is identical in the hierarchical clustering tree. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's say that I have some data with five observations and I perform hierarchical clustering and I get two clusters. And notice that the two clusters, one of them has observations three and five and the other one has observations two, one, and four. And now I also have my perturbed data X prime of phi and I cluster it and I once again get three and five in one cluster and one, two, and four in the other cluster. Well, what I'm saying is that there must be a bug in my code. And the reason for that is this key result in the orange box, which says that the only way that C hat K and C hat K prime can be the same between X and X prime of phi is if everything below the dashed line is the same. And if we look below the dashed line, they're not the same, like over here, one and four are the ones that merged first and over here, two and four are the ones that merged first. So this scenario can't happen. And it turns out that eliminating scenarios like this actually makes the characterization of the set S computationally tractable. And so just to give you a flavor of that, um, remember this is the set that I wanna characterize analytically. It's the set of phi such that the clustering X prime of phi gives me CIK and CIK prime. And then we have a bunch of intersections of sets. And just very, very briefly, we're gonna take the intersection over order of N squared sets. And then we're gonna think about some inequalities involving quadratics. And we're gonna remember that the quadratic equation gives us a way to sort of solve a quadratic inequality just in O of one operations. And at the end of the day, the bottom line is that we can characterize the set of S, the set S in order of N squared time for sort of like most types of hierarchical clustering, um, average centroid median or ward linkage. Um, if you're interested in a different type of clustering called single linkage hierarchical clustering, we can also compute S in order of N squared time but it's a different argument. Um, there's like one type of hierarchical clustering that we don't know how to do this for, which is complete linkage hierarchical clustering. And in that case, we need to use a Monte Carlo approach. But okay, getting back to business, the bottom line here is we can analytically characterize the set S for hierarchical clustering just by being really clever and like writing out sort of like quadratic inequalities corresponding to all of the steps of the clustering procedure. And incredibly, computing this B value is order of N squared time, which is the same order of time required to do hierarchical clustering in the first place. So this is like, in terms of like order of computation, this is actually no more time consuming than it was to cluster your data to begin with. Okay, so that's what we do for hierarchical clustering. And just very briefly for k-means clustering, um, we're gonna be in a similar situation where we need to characterize the set S, in other words, the set of phi such that X prime of phi gives us the same set of clusters that we saw on our original data. Um, and this work was led with my, by my student, Yu Chen Chen, who just graduated and is now doing a postdoc at Stanford. So what we're gonna do here, once again, we're gonna define our p-value to be the probability of seeing at least as big of a difference between the clusters as we saw under the null hypothesis. But we're gonna condition on a bunch of things like that same linear algebra as before. And we're also gonna condition on a bit more, which is that we're gonna condition on every single iteration of k-means clustering. So if you're familiar with k-means clustering, it's like an iterative algorithm. You can run it capital T times. And here the notation C i t of x, that's like the cluster assignment of the ith observation and the teeth iteration of k-means clustering. So what I'm saying here is that I'm gonna condition not just on the fact that clustering my data gave me 
clustering X prime of phi gave me the same clusters as clustering on X. I'm actually going to cluster on the fact that every single iteration of k-means clustering gave identical results. And the reason I'm going to condition on every single iteration of k-means clustering is because that's how we know how to do it. It would be great if we didn't need a condition on quite so much, but that's what we know how to do. And then sort of we end up with a little bit of math that looks similar to what we had before. Um, but the point is that the set S that is sort of the set of interest that we need in order to be able to compute our p-values, we can calculate it in order of n tk time, where k is the number of clusters in k-means clustering, t is the number of iterations of our k-means clustering algorithm, and n is the sample size. And that's the same computational time that it took us to do k-means clustering in the first place. So that means that we can get p-values for k-means clustering in like the same computational order as we performed the k-means clustering algorithm. Okay, so just to summarize, because I know the last few slides are a lot. What's the bottom line? Well, the bottom line is we wanted to test this null hypothesis that was pretty wacky, which was that the mean in the kth cluster equaled the mean in the k prime estimated cluster. And to do that, we just need to look at the CDF of a truncated chi distribution with q degrees of freedom, where we've truncated to a set S. The hard part was coming up with an analytical characterization of the set S. And we did that in order of n squared time for hierarchical clustering, except for complete language, which required Monte Carlo. And then we did it in order of n time for Canyon clustering. Great. OK, so how does it work? Um, well, we're going to look at some single cell RNA sequencing data. Um, and basically, this data consists of a whole bunch of um, different cell immune cell types. So we happen to know that the data consists of T cells, B cells, and monocytes, which are three different types of immune cells. We're just going to pretend we didn't know that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a bunch of just T cells, and I'm going to refer to that as my no clusters data set, because I believe in my heart that they're all T cells, so they probably don't really have clusters. And then I'm also going to obtain a quote unquote clusters data set by taking 200 B cells, 200 T cells, and 200 monocytes. And I'm going to cluster them as though I didn't know that they actually belong to different cell types. And then just some details here about exactly how we did processing. Um, OK, so here's what we get. If we look at our, our like no clusters data set, which consists of only T cells, um, here I've projected some very high dimensional data onto the first two principal components, which is why everything looks like a bit smooshed. Um, but if we perform hierarchical clustering to obtain three clusters, then the clusters are shown in red, green, and blue. And if we just perform like the naive analysis, which just does like, you know, like a multivariate Z test to test for a difference between the clusters, then all of those p-values are less than 0 0.001, all three of the pairwise p-values. But if we perform our selective inference approach, then we get much more modest p-values around 0.7. And to me, this makes sense because I happen to know that these are all T-cells. And I mean, I'm not saying that all T-cells like need to be identical. Of course, there could be clusters among T-cells that I don't know about. But at least, you know, from, you know, bird's eye view as a statistician, this looks reasonable to me that we didn't decide there were multiple clusters among T-cells. Yeah, the normal distribution thing is a big issue, and we'll talk about that in the next part of my talk if I make it there. No, they're not normally distributed. They're literally not normally distributed. Yeah, they're they're. Yeah, and it's going to have some issues because it's not normally distributed, and so we'll talk about that next. Yeah, great. Um, so then next we look at data that has clusters. So I happen to know that there's T cells, B cells, and monocytes here, but I'm going to pretend that I didn't. I clustered the data now. Notice now these clusters are kind of much more credible to me as a you know, statistician from a bird's eye view. And our naive p-values that don't account for the fact that the clusters were estimated from the data are like on the order of 0 0.001, whereas our selective p-values that do account for that are more like, oops, they're also like 0 0.001 actually. So what we see is that in a case where there really is true clusters, are true clusters in the data, we're not really paying much of a price at all for sort of computing these selective p-values. But in case where there are not true clusters, we avoid erroneously rejecting the null hypothesis. OK, so yeah. It's different from saying is your data multimodal, because we don't even need you to believe that the clusters you estimated are real. We're just saying, given that these are the clusters you chose, let's see if we see a difference. But it's important to do that, given that these are the clusters you chose. So this is quite different from like, you know, a, um, 
we're talking about like selecting the true number of clusters and model-based clustering or something. There's nothing here. There's no assumption that there's like any quote unquote true clusters. We haven't made any distributional assumptions here beyond multivariate normality. Okay, so final, oh, yeah. Yeah, but this actually corresponds to what people are doing, right? Because what people are actually doing is they're performing clustering and then they're testing the null hypothesis, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that there are procedures for that, like, yeah, like by Adrian Raffrey and others. Um, but I think, again, I think it's like a fundamentally different question. The question that we're asking here is like, I did some data exploration. It made me ask something. And how can I ask that thing conditional on the fact that I decided to ask it because that's what my data exploration told me to do. So I think these ideas are related, but they're, I think they're quite distinct. So finally, part two, I don't want to hold you guys too long. So um, this is work led by the um, un, unbeatable, unsurpassable, some, some very impressive adjective, tremendous Anna Neufeld, who's a fifth year in stat. Um, on count splitting for single cell RNA sequencing data. So the thing that I want to say is selective inference is not a practical solution. Like I love selective inference, like the, the line of work that I was talking about before. I think it's like super cool and super fun, but often in practice, it's not what people actually need. So one reason is what um, Fang alluded to, which is that it required multivariate normality, which doesn't hold like ever at all. But in particular for single cell RNA sequencing, that's count value data, so just forget it. But actually, even putting aside the distribution, there's sort of a further issue, which is that like in real life, like yes, scientists are clustering their single cell RNA sequencing data, but they're not using hierarchical clustering or k-means. What they're doing is complete chaos. Oh, I, for, I forgot that this talk is recorded. Um, <laughs> but you know, they're, they're, they're using these very complicated pipelines. Amy's, Amy's nodding at me because she knows about the stuff. And it's just like, gosh, like even just trying to write down like a series of steps for what they're doing, let alone trying to characterize this analytically, just like forget it. This is just like not going to work in practice. And it's just not feasible for, for me and my research group to spend a year developing like a bespoke selective inference solution every time like a computational biologist decides to like tweak their method. So we're going to need something that is going to like be a little bit more practical. Also, the multivariate normality issue that that Fung mentioned. Yeah. Multivariate normality is not a reasonable assumption for for count value data, obviously. So now we're going to go back to that cell splitting idea. So remember, we talked before about the idea of splitting the cells into a training and a test set. We said that doesn't work for clustering. It also doesn't work for what I'm calling like trajectory inference, which is like PCA type stuff. Um, but the question today is, can we can we tweak cell splitting to control the type one error? So is there a way that we can sort of modify the the cell splitting procedure? a little bit in order to make this work? And the answer is we can. So here's what single cell RNA sequencing data looks like. We have cells on the rows and genes on the columns, and this is count value data. Each number represents the number of times that a particular piece of RNA was observed in the cell. And I'm gonna propose a really simple procedure, which you've all seen before. Um, and I'm calling it count splitting. So I'm gonna call this element of my data matrix XIJ because it's, you know, the i-th row and the j-th column. And what I'm going to do, Bang, this is for you. You can tell us all what it's called. Uh, we're going to draw xij train from a binomial distribution with size xij and mean epsilon, where epsilon may be like one half or something. And then xij test is going to be xij minus xij train. And so all that we've done is we've just taken every element of our data matrix, and we've created a training and a test set of the same dimension. So we haven't sampled the rows or the columns. We've, we've taken, we've developed a training and a test set of the same dimension as the original data, but the training elements are drawn from a binomial and also the test element is drawn from a binomial. And it turns out this is really nice because it has a very important property. And if this looks familiar to you from having taken like stat 513 or something, then you're right. Because if you have, if you look at this procedure and you assume that your data comes from a Poisson distribution, then you have this wonderful property 
that the training observations you get follow Poisson distribution with the same mean we started out with, but scaled by epsilon. The test observations that we get also are Poisson with the same mean we started with, but, train, but, but scaled by one minus epsilon. And then furthermore, the training and the test data are independent. So this is very well known in the probability literature known as binomial thinning of a Poisson random variable. Um, it also ties into some really interesting ideas by this paper um, put out by Aditya Ramdas's group at CMU. Um, Ramdas, Wasserman, and some other people at CMU um, call, called data blurring, or, or I think they renamed it to be data fission. Um, but this is what we're going to do. We're going to take our data matrix accounts, we're going to model it as being Poisson, and then we're just going to get a training set and a test set, and we're calling it count splitting, because instead of splitting the rows into a training and set, test set or splitting the columns into training and a test set, we're splitting each of the counts in this count matrix. Okay, so why is this useful? Well, the idea is we now have a training and a test set that are independent. Not only are they independent, but they each sort of have the right mean structure, right? Because the, the mean of X train is epsilon times lambda, and the mean of X test is one minus epsilon times lambda, where epsilon is just some number between zero and one, like it might be one half. So we have these X train and X tests that each like look like the original data in terms of having the right distribution and the right mean. But furthermore, they're independent. So I can knock myself out fitting whatever model I want, doing whatever data exploration I'm interested in on the training data. Just I can like explore that data as hard as I want. And then I can do inference on the test data. And they're independent. So I haven't double dipped. So I have like literally solved my double dipping problem with, and the truth is I don't even care. Like if a biologist wants to do this with just like the wildest way that you can think of to estimate latent variables, if they want to do a clustering that would give a statistician a heart attack, go for it. I don't, I don't even need to know what it is as long as they do it on their training data and then we'll do inference on the test data. We're good. And again, the key innovation here relevant relative to like what you might think of is we're not splitting the rows or the observations into training test set. We're splitting the individual counts using this binomial thinning procedure. So yeah, this is critical. This pipeline is totally agnostic to the latent variable estimation performed. So I don't care if they come out with monocles four, five, six through 10, like they just, they can just do whatever they want there. And I'm not even gonna read those papers as long as they fit those models on the training data and then evaluate them on the test data. So we can sort of see what this looks like. Um, so here's some type one error results under Poisson distributed data. So for, we're first generating data where all the genes have the same mean. Then here I'm showing you before my examples had to do with clustering. Now we're looking at principal components instead. So I'm gonna compute the first principal component of the data and I'm going to test each gene for association with the first principal component. And this is a QQ plot. And I would like to see p values on the 45 degree line, because that indicates that under the null hypothesis, all the p values follow uniform zero one distribution. So count splitting, which is our proposal, perfectly on the 45 degree line. The naive approach where you just double dip your data without regards to the fact that you're double dipping. No, none of you would ever do, but that's what like the computational biology software does that gives the green p values which are like hugely anti-conservative so p values are like 10 to the negative 7 instead of uniform 0 1 and then i mentioned at the beginning of this talk that cell splitting where you just like split the the rows of your data matrix into training and test set doesn't work and so here you can see how badly cell splitting does it's hardly an improvement at all over the naive approach okay so um to preempt your questions is the poisson assumption reasonable for this count data, yes, it's reasonable. Uh, here's three papers that are all sort of arguing with different levels of kind of enthusiasm and vigor that a Poisson assumption is the right way to model this data. These papers are written by some of our statistician friends like Nancy Zhang and Raphael Irizarry and Matthew Stevens. So I think that it's quite reasonable to model this data as Poisson, but you know, Poisson distributions are a personal choice and not everybody might wanna make that. So it's worth understanding what happens if we perform Poisson count splitting when our data is not Poisson. So what would happen if, if we did this, but our, our data were not Poisson? Well, Poisson assumption was required to obtain independence of the training and test set. So if we don't have the Poisson assumption, we're not gonna have type one error control. We're not gonna have valid p-values. And it turns out that if we instead assume a negative binomial distribution, then what's really nice is we can exactly characterize the extent to which there's correlation between the training and the test set. And that allows us to kind of get a sense of like how badly are things going to go for us if we made a Poisson assumption and the Poisson assumption didn't hold. So in other words, if you think that your data 
our negative binomial, which is sort of like the main alternative to the Poisson distribution used to model single cell RNA sequencing data. But you just do count splitting because like that's what you have available to you. And you want to know how bad is the situation going to be for you, then this equation sort of gives you a sense of how bad things are going to be because it tells you how much correlation you'll get between your training and your test. Set. Do you mind if we hold it for the end? Because I just have like three more slides and I just want to make it to the end. Thank you so much. Um, but if we're perfectionists, we might not be happy with knowing that with negative binomial data, Poisson count splitting is, is sort of okay. We might want to actually have a technique that's actually tailored for negative binomial data. And so just in very, very recent work, that's what Anna has done next. So this is what we call negative binomial count splitting um, for your eyes only. This has, as far as I know, not yet seen the light of day outside of this room and my office and Anna's office and stuff like that. But anyway, so here, this looks just like what we had before where now we have XIJ, but instead of developing a training and a test set with this binomial thinning procedure, I'm gonna do something that looks really similar, but now I'm gonna get my training set via beta binomial and then my test set is gonna be, once again, X minus the training set. So this is just like what we had before, but before we had binomials, now we have beta binomials. So like, is she making up these words just to torment us? No, she's not. Because if you do this, you get a really beautiful key result, which is that again, this, this procedure where you have your data X, you sample from a beta binomial to get a training set and, from, and then your test set is just X minus X train. It has these lovely properties which is that under the negative binomial assumption, your training set and your test set are both negative binomial, but with means scaled by a value epsilon, which is the number you chose between zero and one. And furthermore, the training and the test set are independent. So if you believe that you have single cell RNA sequencing data that follows a negative binomial distribution and you would like to perform valid inference after latent variable estimation, you are in luck. You do not need to deal with making a Poisson assumption that'll keep you from sleeping at night. You can actually make a negative binomial assumption and everything is gonna be okay. I should say, when I say this is not a well-known result, let me tell you, it's not well-known to me um, or to my co-authors on this, but um, Anna and Lucy, who's also involved in this work, found some references from the time series literature. If you look at these references and you like read the theorems, you'd be like, this is not at all related. It is like very hard to understand that those references are even related to this. But it turns out that you know this this was known in the time series literature, and actually just like showing it from first principles isn't isn't impossible. Um, but it's I'm not aware of like this being a well known result, at least in my world it's not well known. Um, okay, so anyway that's the emoji that I felt when Anna showed this to me. Um, great. Okay, I I had a, another data example, but we're just out of time. There were a lot of questions, so if anyone wants to see what this looks like on data. I'm happy to chat with them offline. I just want to acknowledge just the incredible students I've had who have just 100% been responsible for both the ideation and the execution of this work. Um, previously, Lucy and Yuchun, and, and now current student, Anna, as well as my longtime collaborator, Jacob Bian at USC, and current collaborators, Alexis Battle and Joshua Pop at Johns Hopkins. Um, and for those who are interested, here are our references, which you can also all find on my website. And that's it. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I've been forgetting to repeat questions. And was that Seth with a question in the back? Oh yeah, so, okay, let's let's look at this a little bit more. So negative binomial, first of all, um, you know, there's a lot of parameterizations, but I gave myself a little cheat sheet here because I knew someone would ask. So this parameterization that we're using here, so the mean of X is lambda and the variance of X is lambda plus lambda squared over B. So B is this, B sort of tells me how much over dispersion there is. So if B is infinity or as B approaches infinity, we're actually just gonna end up with the Poisson distribution. And you can see that from the fact that the variance of X is just going to become lambda plus zero as B goes to infinity. So that'll just be Poisson. And then when B gets very small, then the variance becomes arbitrarily large. Um, so now 
this lambda and B are sort of like parameters of the negative binomial distribution. Lambda is the thing that I care about that I'm interested in like doing inference on basically. And then B, unfortunately, is something I don't care about at all. Well, I, which I should say for better or worse, I don't care about it at all. The unfortunate part is that I need to know it in order to do this. Um, oh my gosh, sorry. This is this should say beta binomial. Wait, oh no, 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 no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is what happens when you're standing too close to your slides. So you can only read one line at a time. Sorry, the beta binomial is here. I was like too zoomed in. No, that's correct as written. Yeah. So the reason that it's unfortunate that I don't know B is it's up here. It's at the top of the slide. It's because my splitting procedure actually like requires that I know B, which I don't know. So we can try to estimate B. Now we are working on writing this paper. I am not interested in writing a paper about how to estimate B for the negative binomial. Like estimating over dispersion for negative binomials, like number one, that's like not my jam. And number two, other people have written a lot of papers about it. So we're we're going to cast our paper, just like FYI, peer review of coming attractions, as like, you know, use your favorite way to estimate B. And like in our simulations, for example, we're just going to use like a way from the literature that other people have used a lot. Um, but if you're wondering, like, what's the best way to estimate B in a negative binomial distribution, um, you need to read the literature or write your own paper because we're not proposing a new way. I hope that answers that question. Great. I have one more question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really great question that I actually hadn't thought about before. But so just I'm going to like fly by the seat of my pants with this answer, which is that if we look at the variance, the variance is, you know, like the mean plus the mean squared divided by the over dispersion. So that epsilon is going to go in the denominator. So that's going to increase the variance. So it's sort of like the it's sort of like we're going to be making our lives worse and making it harder to estimate that parameter of interest by having larger variance. So I think that's that's how I see the effect of um, the fact that the over dis or that the parameter B has decreased. It's it doesn't affect obviously like the mean. The mean is still going to be proportional to lambda, um, but it has made that variance associated with the training data larger. Thank you, Daniela, for opening the seminar season. Uh, one more short announcement for grad and post-grad students in SATS. So this year we're doing something different. So starting from next week for external speakers who are in person, we will have like a pizza lunch available to you, but you need to RSVP to Christine's email. So you all should have received this email. Uh, please RSVP if you want some pizza next week. All right. Uh, thank you all again for coming.